Get $10 off your next $50 or more purchase when you sign up for text alerts from Academy Sports and Outdoors. Text the word FISHING to 22369. Once again, that's FISHING to 22369. Offer expires 731 of 2022, and message and data rates may apply. Fisherman's more fish more often. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Fisherman's Post Saltwater Podcast Series. This episode is titled Bait Fishing for Summer Mahi. I'm going to be talking to Captain Daniel Batts of Surf City Charters out of the Topsail Island area. And we're going to be going into bait options. We're going to talk about rigs. We're going to talk about finding fish. And then we're going to move into techniques, trolling tips. Uh, my name is Gary Hurley of Fisherman's Post. Fisherman's Post has been serving the saltwater fishing community of North Carolina since 2003. We've been bringing you fishing reports, fishing information, fishing tournaments, fishing schools, and here in our latest and greatest effort, the podcast series where we reach out to our captain and guide friends from up and down the North Carolina coast and ask them to share with us their thoughts, their insights on how to catch more fish more often. And in this endeavor, I am joined, just as I am every week, by Billy Thorpe of Thorpe Creative. Billy, welcome to yet another episode. Gary, it's good to see you, man. I thought you were going to start singing the theme song there for a minute. <laughs> uh, I was like, all right, let's go. A little karaoke. In my, sl- in my sleep sometimes, but not on mic. <laughs> <laughs> well, man, I'm excited to be talking about mahi. I'm excited to be uh, talking about fishing. Even though I haven't been fishing, but I did take my three-year-old fishing, so he caught his first fish, little little pond fish. So now, um, now I'll never get to fish again since and he loved it. So All that, right. that was pretty fun. So yeah, got him started. Well, that's that's getting you closer to fishing. If we get little man on, yeah, yeah, just give me like ten more years, and then maybe I'll get to join in, right? But maybe. now I'm just baiting hooks and taking fish off. So. All good, but man, excited about the show, excited about our sponsors, so we want to thank those guys. Uh, first up is Bland Landscaping. We want to thank Bland and, and the team over there for being a part of the Fisherman's Post podcast. They are um, a well-established company here in the North Carolina area, and they're currently looking and searching for commercial, industrial, homeowner association customers. So if that's you, if you're part of a homeowner's association, Gary, then call these guys up, see if you can get them in. And, uh, and get them working for you, working for the association. So, no, I mean, it just makes sense to hire bland landscaping, man. Summer is precious, time on the water is precious. I enjoy working in the yard, but given getting out on the boat or cutting the grass, even though I enjoy it, man, let's hire bland and get out yeah. on the water more. Absolutely, and they support us, so try to go support them where you can. We really appreciate them. And also, our longest-running sponsor of the show, Marine Warehouse Center. I actually got a new message from them, so we'll be right here in just a second. At Marine Warehouse, we have everything from trailer, trailer parts, engines, engine parts, new boats, boat parts, a full store. We have a service department. We are your one-stop shop for marine equipment and hardware. We offer a wide variety of parts and accessories for all your marine needs. The best part about working at Marine Warehouse Center is to help customers really get the most out of their coastal lifestyle and share our love for the water. At Marine Warehouse, we're here to get you out on the water because of our love for the water. We like being out there and we want you out there with us. All right. Oh, man. They got fishing gear, too. I didn't even know. I didn't even know. I think I knew a little bit, but it looks like they've expanded that part. They have, man. Yeah. They've expanded. It's worth a stop into the store just to look around. And, yeah. again, sales service parts, man, they've got it covered, but you're right. And even apparel, man, like everyone else, they're getting into the apparel, yeah. just like that sporty hat you got. Dude, I love this hat. I've been wearing this thing forever. Uh, but, yeah, go in there, buy you a fishing rod, and tell your wife that uh, they gave you a boat for free. I mean, it'll work. <laughs> That's my plan. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Honey, I swear, it was buy a rod, get a boat for free. The rod was sixty grand, but it was worth it. All right. Good um, luck. Man. But I would say go in there and see Emmett, but you're not going to, man. I, I mean, I think I've been telling you guys, like, he has been kind of flying the, flying away from the coop here recently, and it's no different this week, Gary. He is Where been, in the world is Emmett this week? Where in the world is Emmett? Well, I'll give you a little hint. He is lives in the same or he's visiting the same place where spongebob lives can you guess where he is underwater he's underwater that is a hundred percent accurate and emmett is a friend of the sea turtles <laughs> ladies and gentlemen he is snorkeling with the sea turtles can't even believe it it's not working still got his shirt on still got his hat on but he is 
So well, yeah, even when he's underwater, man, he's still representing <laughs> Suzuki Marine Warehouse Center. Good for him. I mean, maybe he's under there like checking out a boat motor or something live action, but I don't know. Or just petting sea turtles. <laughs> Good go. for Emmett. I don't know how long this bit's gonna last, Gary, but I really I, don't either. I really enjoy it. <laughs> if you guys aren't watching, if you're listening to the show, make sure you get our YouTube channel and at least uh scroll forward to I don't know, the five minute mark so you can see what that looks like. But anyway, man, super super amounts of fun and Emmett is having a good time. So All right. Well, I am setting up Billy's best takeaway, but before that, we have both a fishing photo and I'm gonna plug fishing reports all right i'll do the fishing photo first we got jerry weeks of raleigh with a 25 pound dolphin that was caught while fishing out of moorhead city uh good looking picture there good looking fish beautiful fish so appreciate you sending in the photo yeah we got a pretty good look at jerry there <laughs> we got 50 percent of jerry <laughs> he's not a photographer but hey he got a good fish are we gonna are we looking at a fish photo <laughs> podcast episode <laughs> I'll be the guest. <laughs> you can interview me. <laughs> like, what does a good fish photo look like? <laughs> what does one not look like? But anyway. he's happy. I mean, even half face, they can see that he's happy, and he should be, man. 25-pound mahi yeah. is a serious mahi, man. Those are the fish that look bigger than they are. Often you think you got a 25-pounder, and then it turns out to be like 12 or 15 so 25 legit good for jerry yeah man good for him good eating there well jerry or gary jerry <laughs> gary i'll throw it over to you to promote some fishing reports yeah we don't have offshore reports yet i'll look at that tease we don't have offshore Ooh. reports yet but right now we have inshore weekly fishing reports delivered in audio and video format so the paper is still once a month the website is still updated once a month free reports but if you want more if you want weekly then sign up under member content at fishermanspost.com small fee gets you weekly access to fishing reports we talk to 11 captains up and down the north carolina coast talk to each one for about four to seven minutes so you get the skinny on what's happening and they finish their report with a weekender best bet their best suggestion for you to catch a fish over the weekend released every thursday yeah, man. It's awesome. And it's this is released on Tuesday, so you have a couple days to hurry up and buy before the next report drops. Yeah. So and go, go, go. Once you buy, you access all the ones we've already done. So yeah. you could sign up and see what these guys have been doing since April. We started in April. Yeah, man. Awesome. All right. So Billy's best takeaway. We're going to be talking summer mahi. We're not talking about pond fishing. We're talking summer <laughs> mahi. All and right. I'm coming back to you for Billy's best takeaway. But right now, man, it's my pleasure to introduce... Captain Daniel Batts, Surf City Charters out of the Topsail Island area. Happy to have you on the show, Daniel. Ready to talk about bait fishing for summer mahi. Thanks again for being available. Hey, Gary. Thanks, man. Appreciate you having us on. Uh, excited to talk about some mahi. Well, right on, man. It is a popular species, pos popular to target, popular to catch, popular to eat. But before we get to the main event, as is tradition on the Fisherman's Post podcast, I got two questions for you. Daniel, you say you're ready. I give you question number one. Yes, sir. Question number one, why should we listen? Why should we tune in to hear what Daniel Batts has to say about a mahi? Well, we've been fishing, uh, charter fishing out of Topsail Island for the last seven years now. Um, and recreational fishing, tournament fishing many years before that. Um, we've you know spent a lot of days on the water and we've kind of figured out you know some things work a little bit better here out of topsail than they might out of moorhead um we do things a little bit differently because we see things at different times of the year we see a little bit different currents and stuff like that um so we've definitely been able to narrow down what works for us out of topsail and you know if you're around topsail area we definitely can help you out get you on some fish and teach you how to do it well right on that is a fantastic i mean you are a seasoned podcaster in disguise because that was a fantastically delivered answer to question number one um we're moving on question number two non-fishing related question you say you're ready i give you question number two let's go for it all right so surf city charters happens right in my sort of client list next to surf city pier so when i see surf city charters i think inevitably a little bit of surf city pier i got a topsail pier question for you so we're going to see what you know Topsail Island currently has three fishing piers, as you know, Sea View, Surf City, Jolly Roger. Can you name for me one of the three piers that was wiped out in Hurricane Fran 20-plus years ago? 
I'm either going to say the old Dolphin Pier. Um, oh, what was the other one? Um, there's one right there uh, north of Surf City Pier. That could have been the – that's around where the Dolphin Pier was at. Um, I, I don't know, man. That, that might be my only one that I could come up with off the top of my head, to be honest with you. Well, I'm going to accept Dolphin Pier, even though that's not written down as one of my options, but I'm just going to guess that you got the local lingo. But if I say the three, oh, maybe you can tell me which one you're referring to when you say Dolphin Pier. Okay. Barnacle Bills. Yeah, that's what I was getting ready to say. Scotch Bonnet. And Ocean City. Yeah, uh, Barnacle Bills. Is, is what, what you're I- talking about? All right, we're calling you a winner. Let's get back to Mahi Bait Fishing. So bait fishing for mahi, like the topic, excited to talk about it, and I like how you want to start. So when we're talking about bait fishing for mahi, what are the bait options in your mind? Um, I'll be honest, my go-to for the past several years, um, we've been really trying to get to the live baiting aspect of it. Um, I've found that me, my mates, and my customers seem to enjoy it a little bit better. We use a lot of light tackle, nothing over 20-pound test line. Um, and we're use, we're, we prefer Menhaden as our bait of choice more we live baiting. Um, and that seems to be the ticket around June, July, uh, when that water gets real high. So live Menhaden, what's the perfect size Menhaden in your mind? Um, so I got two different ones. It depends if I'm in the 20 mile range, I like a four to six or excuse me. I really like a four, um, for those dolphin that we've been seeing recently that uh from what i've been told they're called pompano dolphin um we've seen in the past year or so that supposedly came up from florida they don't get more than about eight nine pounds and i've noticed the bigger pogies they just can't swallow it all they definitely want to eat it they want to strike it but they can't get that whole thing in um so for those dolphin when i'm uh you can't really troll them but we use them as a pitch bait um whenever we can get them underneath the boat and if you're going to go out for live menhaden mahi fishing like what's the minimum like i'm not going to go offshore unless i have x amount of pogies in the live well i uh, so i've been told that um i go a little heavy-handed i like to have you know 70 to 80 baits um because in my experience um having a little bit extra even if they're smaller baits that you would necessarily wouldn't want to put a hook on I've noticed that having those baits that you can have one of your guys sitting there throwing out at all times will at least keep that school attracted to your boat and it'll keep them right there on you. Um, so I personally, you know, 60 to 80 baits is what I like to have. I understand everybody's live wells aren't set up like that. Um, so really, I mean, if you can get 20 to 30 baits, you can make a decent day of it. Um, I definitely probably wouldn't head out 30 miles without any more than a couple dozen baits because you're just asking to have an upset day. All right. So when we were setting up the show, we talked about making it just live baiting for summer mahi, but we decided against that because you had some thoughts on other baits and figuring if we called it bait fishing, we could get your thoughts in on other baits. So other than a live menhaden, if you're bait fishing for mahi, what else is on the table? Um, you know, everybody's go-to is the ballyhoo fishing, which of course I do love ballyhoo fishing. Um, April, May, when I'm fishing the Gulf Stream mainly, that's what we're going to do when we're seeing a lot of the 20, 30-pound gaffers and stuff like that. Um, but when you're fishing in that 20 to 40-mile range, from what we've noticed, we've, I mean, I, again, we've seen a smaller dolphin, and everybody just complains about short strikes. So what we, I had uh, Jody from Blue Water Candy kind of told me about the squid trick, and it was actually for King Mackerel. Um, in the fall when the King Mackerel, would be, the school King Mackerel were being real skittish on, you know, cigar minnows and stuff. He told me to start trying squid, and I started trying that for those mahi, and it seems to be the perfect trick. Um, they have small mouths. That squid's real easy to get, you know, get find that hook, and it, they seem to love it. They pull perfect every time, and just they come straight out of the pack in the one-pound one squid packages, and we put them the whole thing on there, hook them by the hood, and put your treble stingers throughout it, and we've seen that that's – at least been able to draw the school to us and so like that my perfect day would be pulling a couple of squids out there and then drawing that uh, school of mahi to us and then trying to throw some live baits at them all right so squid yes ballyhoo unless no in the 20 to 40 live pogey absolutely 
Um, you started talking about rigs with the squid. Let's let's circle back. Talk to me about your live pogey rig when you're summer mahi fishing. You know, is there any difference to the king rigs that people might be used to? And then we'll go and then we'll go back into a little bit more detail about squid if you don't mind. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I definitely do think that the mahi definitely like the greens, pinks. Um, I personally like a uh, blue water candy wedgie, but you can use. I mean, Big Nick has them multiple different types you can use. Um, they come pre-rigged from the store. Um, I like to rig mine up. I use uh, what's called seven strand. Uh, a lot of them are coming out with that now anyway. Um, and I just use a number four uh, treble hook kingfish. And um, I think it's number five J hook for the head. And we just really take uh, the full squid and uh, what's called the hood at the point of the squid. We hook that onto the J-hook and make sure your head's locked into that J-hook. And then you just string that squid all the way out onto your two stingers. And obviously put it in the water, check, make sure it swims right. But nine times out of ten, those squid are going to be a lot easier to rig than cigar minnows and ballyhoo for other people that say they have the helicopter and problem and stuff like that. It definitely eliminates a lot of those problems and helps on short strikes as well. So how long is the squid that you're rigging up typically? Um, you know, I'd say about six inches, probably six to seven inches. Um, I tell a lot of people, I personally I always, when I'm buying my squid packages, I check them all because you will find some that'll be three to four inches and you can't really do much with that. Um, so before I buy my squid, I check to make sure that's the larger pack. Some stores sell different grades of them and stuff like that, but ultimately you're going to have to check and make sure you get a little bit bigger squids. Um, and I, some people have said using squid strips works. I personally haven't really tried it too much or seen too much success with it. So I personally like using whole squid. And like I said, it comes in those one pound boxes, uh, packages, just like you get, you know, for dropping on the bottom. How many, roughly how many squids do you typically find in a one pound box? Oh, it get about seven to eight if it's the size that I'm looking for. I um, mean, you know, I tell, especially, I'm sure you remember years, uh, it was probably about two years ago, we had that real bad uh selection of cigar minnows that they were just blowing out all over the place and you couldn't unfreeze them one time um and that's the one a lot of us switched to that squid because it's honestly cheaper um it works better and it lasts a lot longer and if the troll bite's not good you can take it right off and put it on the bottom as well all right so i absolutely follow the squid conversation but if you if you talked about your live pogey rig you either I either missed it or you moved through it too quickly for me. So, so give me the skinny on the pogey rig. Yeah. So we, um, same thing that number, uh, it's 30 pound seven strand. Um, and it, we like to use, I like about a 12 to 14 inch leader. And, uh, then at the back, you just use those, uh, two number four kingfish treble hooks and you just snail hook them on there. Uh, you start with the back one, snail it on there. And then you go up to your, uh, swivel and then it goes straight to your main line and uh that's all i you know depending on the baits that i'm using i'll space my treble hooks out you know a couple inches to three inches and that just varies on what kind of how big the bait i'm using and what i'm really targeting uh, that's all that's all it is i really i use some skirts on them sometimes but what i've noticed is the live bait usually is enough for them if you're around the fish and so that Again, I'm sorry if I'm slow. The second treble, is that dangling or is that attached? It's attached, yes, sir. Um, so both of them are straight hardwired and snailed into it. So everything's in line. It's hard um, with the pogies. What we do is that first treble hook goes through the nose. So you're going to have one hook through the nose and then the other two hanging on the side. And then I tell everybody, whenever you're hooking that back stinger hook in there, don't stretch it as far as you can. Give, put a little bit of play in it. That way you give that pogey enough room to swim and look natural in the water. And you want to stick it on the back tar part of them. So usually when they're sitting on top of the water, any kind of that wired leader is going to be sitting on top and that fish isn't going to be able to see it. All right. I'll follow that, man. Everything makes sense. So I, unless you've got something else that I didn't set you up by asking about rigs or bait options, We'll move into uh, probably what everyone is most curious about is finding fish, finding fish, finding fish. So set the stage for us. We're talking, in your mind, are we talking June, July, August? Like, help me out here. Help everyone out finding summer mahi. So, and honestly, I, I'm sure a lot of people can attest to this. We've been, this has been a 
really different year for us. Um, we're seeing 83 degree water 15 miles off the beach right now, uh, first thing in the morning, and it goes all the way up to 40 miles as of this past week. And, you know, usually we don't see those for a couple more weeks, those temperatures. So if this, everything has moved in early this year, it seems like. Our kings moved in early. The mahi are already here. We're seeing some at 14, 15 miles right now. Um, but I, for what I can say, what I've been looking for this past week, because uh, we've had a lot of different direction winds, it's been changing every other day. So we really haven't had accumulated grass. It's just been a lot of scattered grass. You'll find a few patches here and there. Um, but I've been looking for current breaks and temperature breaks right now to kind of get me my starting point. Um, so I know for the past three trips this past week, I've been working. Uh, it's everywhere from like 81 and a half to 83 and a half. Um, so about a two degree, two and a half degree temp break right there. Um, and on days like we've had the past couple of days, you can kind of see it. You'll see where current breaks are and where two different currents meet. And, you know, it might be a little bit rougher on one side and smooth on the other side. Um, but you're mainly going to have to be watching your uh, bottom unit to make sure that you're not running over those tent breaks. Because um, everybody likes to go as far out as they can. But I've gotten on 50, 60 dolphin at 20 miles because of tent breaks. And that's just the main thing I tell people to look for is watch your bottom machine see what, you, what the temperature's saying when you leave the inlet and just keep reading it all the way out until you're around the hole that you want to be at. And of course, if you can find a temp break that's around some kind of bottom structure, that's always going to be a bonus right there. So what, uh, so what research do you do or what, what do you do the night before or like even early morning before you leave the dock? Are, are you checking sea surface charts or are you doing any of that homework or you just have a plan and you keep an eye on the machine? Uh, every single night. I mean, I check sea surface temperatures before I leave that night. Um, I check them before I leave out the next day because um, it's always going to change. And you have to kind of stay on top of it because it's going to be moving, you know, up towards Moorhead in two days. So you have to kind of adjust your trips every day to make sure you're kind of staying on certain temp breaks. I have certain places that this time of year they just like to hang around. And they definitely will produce, you know, five fish a day, stuff like that. But if you want to get, you know, 20, 30 dolphin, you got to stay on those hard breaks and um, any kind of grass patch. Um, I know uh, Sirius XM, they have a good one now for a lot of people that shows um, grass patches on top and stuff like that. It does show surface temperature as well while you're out there on your unit. So that's a good thing that a lot of people could use. Um, and uh that's, I would say, the main thing that we look for, um, up dwellings and down dwellings in the water. Um, you can, I, the app that I have, um, Rip Charts, they do, it's, I can look at all that the night before. I can see where bait stacked up in the water column, um, and that's pretty much everything that goes in my formula for the next day. So this is, uh, you know, this is news to me. I'm, I'll, I'm self-admittedly challenged when I'm talking about 20 plus miles off fishing you know i'm you know I'm, it's not it's not my absolute comfort zone so there are now places you can go that'll help you find grass patches wheat grass oh, yeah. yes sir yeah it's a uh, serious xm it overlays right onto your uh garmin simrad unit whatever you have and it will I can't say how accurately it will, but it'll show where the grass patches should be. And from what I've been told, I don't use that one. I don't use a Sirius XM one, but what I've been told is it works pretty well. Um, there's also now, um, that's quick shots or something like that. There's a couple of different programs that, you know, you can pay a couple of dollars to, and they'll show you where the current breaks are and stuff like that to make it easier on people. So they don't have to be able to study these apps and know exactly what they're talking about when they're looking at this stuff because it does take a little bit of time reading this stuff and learning about everything to get it figured out all right and i don't want to go down the rabbit hole but i'm going to ask one more follow-up question before we move on so how do how does identifying upwellings downwellings help you out how do you use that information yeah so basically what it is it's uh currents coming up from the bottom um down dwellings, so I guess the easiest way I could explain it is, is if you're looking at that exact chart, um, your down dwellings are going to be a release shade of blue. Your up dwellings are going to be a, a more red, orangish color. Um, and 
obviously what we're looking for is the blue. We like those down dwellings. Um, we like where the bait comes up to the top more or less, um, it holds for more of those predator fish and uh, has the right current that we're looking for. Um, and again, the, you can see, you kind of have to study those charts to kind of exactly get them narrowed down. Um, but they make it a little bit easier nowadays with, like I said, relief colors and stuff like that for you to be able to read it for your everyday person. Um, right on, man. I like, I've enjoyed that conversation. I already feel smarter from this podcast and we're, and we're having even put a line in the water yet. So I think that's where we are. I mean, we're moving along quickly, but I mean, I think we're covering everything just very efficiently. So I guess how I would set up this next section is Daniel, I'm on your boat. You know, you have a plan. We're out there. You see on your machine the break, the the temperature break that you are that intrigues you. So we come off plane, and what happens next? Set me up. So normally, what I like to do um, is, especially if I'm in that you know ten to fifteen pound dolphin that I'm seeing, um, we always my mates know I'm very adamant about it. I have four spinning rods that stay on my boat anytime I go uh, mahi fishing. They all have 40 pound fluoro tied straight to main line with a number four live bait hook. And as soon as we get a decent dolphin on, if we can see and look down to see that he's bringing any up fish up with him, we immediately start either deploying our live bait on those uh, live bait hooks, or you can just use whole squid, cup ballyhoo. I mean, um, it's, it's a 50 50 chance. Uh, I was just telling my customers the other day when we were out there, we had about I'd say 30 dolphin underneath us and we could only get about 10 of them to eat out of that school. And, you know, and we could sit there and almost touch them with our hand. They were so close to us, but certain dolphin are finicky and you'll see them go right up to a bait and look at it, sniff it and then swim right away. Um, so I tell everybody the main key is keeping them there. Have somebody throwing bait out, um, as much bait as you can get in the water to keep their attention and keep them on you is the key. And then always try to have at least one fish in the water. So my, I do have one big um, J hook. It's about a number seven. And we usually try to get the first fish on that off the pitch rod. That way I got a good hook in that fish and he can kind of hang out right there. And normally if the, the rest of the fish are trying to feed, they will all stay right beside that fish. And all you basically have to do is shower, squid, ballyhoo, cut bait on top of them and then mix your little bit of bait on top of it that's on your rod and it won't take no time and they'll be on it. Well, Daniel, that is good information to know, but you give me too much confidence. What I'm saying is we came off plane. I don't have it. We don't have a fish hooked up. We have just arrived at the area that you want to try to find a fish. So I guess what I was saying is like, tell me about the spread you put out. Like once you're, once we're just starting to fish to hopefully get to that next stage you talked about. So tell me about the Daniel Bats mahi spread, summer mahi spread. So for the summertime, like I said, we do switch away from the ballyhoo fishing. Um, so we put our internationals and speedmasters, those big rods away. And all I like to use personally are, I have a set of ugly stick live bait custom rods um, and some pin 545s. Um, and it's my live bait king setup, really, essentially. And um, I use all wedgies on all my rides. That's just work, what works for me. I have three up top. I have two downriggers. And if, if I'm fishing in 90 foot of water, I'm going to have one set about 30 foot. And then I'm going to have the other set about 55, unless it gets sharked up. And then I might bring it up a little bit. But I like to try two different ty uh, levels because you know, you're going to have different thermoclines at different levels of the water. Um, so I like to try to have a little bit of bait everywhere and then see what's hitting, what they're liking, what depth. Um, and that's going to be usually my go-to. I really don't run outriggers when I'm doing this um, for the summertime mahi. It's just a simple five-rod spread. If I really can't get them to come up, I'll throw a squid chain or a little spreader bar or something in there just to entice them a little bit. But uh, usually if you're around the fish, you found that temp break and everything, it won't take them too much to get them fired up. All right. So again, 20 plus miles, I'm challenged. So I got to back up and make sure I understood what you said. So three up top, two on the downringer. Now, are we talking about a complete squid spread? Like we are holding on to our pogies for if, if we catch a fish and we are just trolling squid or are we doing like the 
knocking it in and out of gear, pulling some live bait behind the boat as well. Yeah, I mean, if I haven't in the days previous, if I haven't already found a school mahi that I'm pretty confident they haven't moved on me, I'm going to usually my go to is going to be a squid spread because I'm more or less trying to cover some ground. I'm trying to figure out where the fish are at. I'm trying to just get as much bait and present to as many fish as possible. Now, if I do, of course, when I find that school, my first instinct, if I do have the live bait is to go to live bait or if I've already found the fish and um, sometimes they'll be home on the grass patch or a pallet out there or something like that. Then we, of course, love to pull uh, live bait and we're just bumping in and out of gear enough to keep the line straight and the bait not skipping off the top. And so to go back to the squid troll, I mean, I know you said you're not big on skirts for the live bait, but but big on skirts for the squid. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I mean, I just said not I wouldn't even say more or less skirts. Um, you want something that dives a little bit like, you know, a uh, wedgie or a uh, Macahoo or something like that. I definitely have seen a lot better success than the traditional old school king rig, as we'd call it, with like a duster or something like that on it. Um, the divers definitely do help a little bit because, in, of course, in summertime, we're talking 83 degree water we're fishing. Most of them are going to try to find that thermocline a little bit deeper underneath that uh, surface temperature. And what's my what's your trolling speed? Uh, so when I'm before I find them, I usually will roll about six miles an hour. But once I can kind of get the fish narrowed down to where I think they're at. I really will slow troll it sometimes to four and a half, five. Um, I've noticed that sometimes they don't like that fast, especially the smaller dolphin, like 10, 12 pounders and stuff. Um, they don't necessarily like it that fast like you would when you're ballyhoo fishing. So I'll do it, you know, four and a half, five miles an hour and uh, just see what they like that day. It depends on the sea temp or uh, if it's rough out, slick out. Um, definitely when it's rough, I will go a little bit slower just to give them more time to look at it, give them a better chance at getting hooked up. And so my next question, again, because I, 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 I'm just not comfortable here or familiar here. I mean, are you always starting out on the warmer side of the temperature break? Or are there other variables that come into play, whether you start on the warmer side or the two degree, one degree, one and a half degree cooler side? Usually, um, as it would have it, because, you know, when you're running out there, you're running straight off and you're usually going to find that break and you're going to end up being on that warmer side after you've already ran over it. So I'll automatically, the first thing I do, I whip it around and we just get baits out. And that's my first thing is to do. If I see something that looks really good, I just want baits in the water. Um, the only thing that will hold me up, if there's a strong grass uh, line on that temperature break, then, you know, uh, certain times you're going to have on that warmer side, there will be a ton of scattered grass on this side, but the colder side will be completely clean. So obviously everybody doesn't want to be shagging grass all day, every day, because that's not fun for anybody. So I will go switch over to that colder side just to get away from that grass. But, you know, sometimes that's where the fish are is in that scattered grass and you just got to pick through it and it's a pain, but you just got to go through it sometimes. First choice with current or against current? Uh, I always like to go up current and, uh, see see what i need uh headway um because that also depending on how deep of water you are and what, what current's looking like will be that decision on how deep you can set your down riggers um because when you you're when you're pulling uh with these live bait rods you can't use the super heavy clips on your down riggers so you got to use a little bit lighter clip and they always can't take that much current depending on where you're at so i like to go up current go ahead and get that out of the way figure it out and now i got that over with all right, so now we we have our five rods spread out, and I think that'll be popular with our listeners because not everyone has outriggers, not everyone can manipulate eight ro eight lines. So I think five sounds like the perfect amount: three top and two downriggers, something like that. So if I I guess now we're trolling and we get a hit on one of our top lines, what happens now? Do all the lines stay in the water? Do you keep up pace? When do you back off? When do you pull in lines? Um, so I mean. That all, I like to judge that based on the angler that I have. Um, if I have somebody that's new on, I'm going to keep rolling at least three miles an hour um, while my other mates, so say, for instance, if it's my shotgun rod, um, that's going to be the longest rod you have out from the boat. That you can give it a few seconds because you're already away from your other lines. You don't have to worry about tangling up again or anything like that. 
And so I always like to give it a little bit just in case, like I said, that school comes up and you can get a couple more bites. Um, when you get, you know, one of your shorter rods hit or your downrigger hit that's the closest to the boat, you're going to have to start clearing the other lines just to get them out of the way because I'm sure, Gary, you've seen how Mahi acts. They dance, they jump, they go crazy. So you don't want to get tangled up and then have him pull a hook because you're on another rig. Um, so I, it just kind of depends on the situation, really. Um, I got you. Got to got to take everything into account. Um, but most of the time, I'm gonna at least be rolling two to three miles an hour just to keep pressure on those uh, treble hooks because that's what nine times out of ten they're gonna find that treble hook, and you just got to keep constant pressure on that treble hook so he stays hooked up. And are you? Is there? A, are you cool with leaving the downrigger lines in? no matter what or is there or do they come up every time eventually yeah and, and it, it's it depends uh, my mates know if it's that shotgun i want those down, down um a good trick that i've learned as well a lot of people i've noticed when i'm on other people's boats they'll pop the downriggers and then that mate will be reeling that rod in as soon as possible i tell all my guys whenever we're having to clear the downriggers if it gets to that and it's one of those shorter rods and i need the downriggers cleared you just pop the downrigger let them float up because I've had, I can't tell you how many fish hit it on that free floating up from 60 foot off the bottom. They just can't resist that free floating squid coming up. So we get a lot of hits off of that. But um, if I have one of my shorter rods hit and he's going wild and behind the boat, then you're going to need to clean those downriggers. Uh, so it's more of a judgment call of what the fish is doing, how he's acting, and what you can do with them, if you can get them off the bow or not. All right. So I might be still in the judgment call arena, but I'm going to keep asking questions. So... We have this fish that we hooked on this troll on the squid bait and it's coming up and you've got very good reason to believe like this is going to turn into a live baiting opportunity. So when it, it turns into your mind into a live baiting opportunity, are we keeping the squid treble hook fish in the water until we get a live bait hook? Are we keeping the other squid baits even when we've made the decision that we're going to switch over to pitch and live pogies? What happens there during that sort of high energy time of the first mahi off the bow of the boat off the back of the boat and we believe there's others with it honestly and my guys know it's whatever you can get to first um because i've i've seen i've thrown mullet pogies all kinds of live bait in front of mahi and then they only wanted my squid then i've thrown tons of squid at them and they only wanted the mahi so like the more time you mess and watch these mahi you'll see that there is no predictability about them or what they want or what they're going to do at that time um, so I tell everybody, usually we have, uh, when I'm mahi fishing, I have like a gallon size bag of just chunked up squid. Um, so my mate's first reaction is to start getting handfuls of that out. Then I can kind of see if they're feeding on that squid or not. So if they're feeding on that squid, then the easiest thing to do is just grab some of that squid, put it on that, uh, circle hook that I was talking about and pitch that out. But if they're sitting there looking at that squid saying, Oh, I don't like that. Then I'll have them throw a live bait out and see if that'll do any better. All right, I got more. I got more questions. So I know you have anglers of all different ability. You know, over the course of a summer, over the course of a mahi trip. So, what is a pretty common piece of advice? Like, where do people really? Where could people potentially mess up? You have to tell them what to avoid. What do you tell them to be sure to do? Um, the main thing that you want to do is just keep that rod tight. Um, so again, with the, the live bait rods that like I use they're very flexible. So that's why I personally like them because I can see by that rod tip what I need to do as the captain. Um, sometimes, you know, if if they're on a long fight, they're going to get tired out and they're going to need a little bit of break. So don't necessarily run towards the fish. Um, I kind of either back away or quarter them and that way I can, I can deal with it and it's not all on the angler. So sometimes if they need a little bit of break, I can kind of run away from the fish just to keep that rod tight, let them get the strength back and go back to it. And then other cases are, I mean, sometimes when you got a great guy on the boat that, I mean, just can bring them in. I like to get them on the bow and I'll kind of run the fish down a little bit just to help, you know, time. And usually that helps a little bit because when you can circle back on that fish, you have better chances of finding where that fish came from and that other school that was with it. So that's my main goal when I have Mahi is I try not to get too far from where I hooked up. That way I can either A, circle back or bring that school up. So this might be a good time for me to ask what kind of boat you run because people will be curious about putting someone on the bow and five lines effectively. What What is Surf City Charters Offshore Vessel? 
we have a 27 foot Onslow Bay. Um, you know, it's a just typical center console. It does have an open bow, and that's kind of what we like because we like to live bait a lot. Um, it's very easy to maneuver around the boat, and uh, I can kind of keep people wherever I need. But, you know, you can kind of do the same thing on any boat. You know, you don't have to have that big of a boat or anything like that. Um, I mean, we've caught plenty of mahi on our 20-foot skiff uh, at 10 miles out before. So, you know, you don't need all that to get it done. All right, man, I think I'm wrapping this up. I think we're wrapping this up. Final thoughts, f- best piece of advice, any more suggestions for someone watching, listening to this, and thinking, man, I want to go get in on this summer mahi. He's making this sound very doable. Yeah, um, again, I, like I said, I stress more than anything, look at sea surf attempts, uh, study it, learn about it, learn what you're looking for. Um, everybody just says, go look for tent breaks, but look why you're looking for it and what you need to look for while you're actually out there. So I tell everybody, I mean, definitely go out there, uh, experience it firsthand. It's going to help you more than anything, but also you can do a lot of research. I mean, there's a lot of places you can find good, helpful information on and, uh, know what you're looking for as far as, um, Certain grass patches, I mean, you can go hit one uh, grass patch the size of a golf course and no fish on it. Um, so don't sit there and beat one grass patch up all day. Uh, keep riding around, keep looking, and uh, I, I really don't give a place more than hours. So if I'm not getting any bites, nothing like that, I'll roll on to the next spot and keep trying. All right, so on that 27 Onslow Bay, when you're not targeting summer mahi, a couple questions. What else are you targeting in the summer? And then – what do you, how do you shift plans in the fall? Um, so, you know, that's another reason why we like to live bait a lot. At that 30-mile range, we see a lot of sailfish uh, while we're live baiting. Uh, you know, everybody loves seeing a sailfish jump around, especially on some real light tackle. It's a lot of fun running them down off the bow, chasing them down. It's always a great time. We see a lot of cobia, king mackerel. Um, really, with, especially with that live bait, uh, you can kind of see anything. And uh, same thing with the squid. We've caught it all on the squid as well. Um, hopefully uh, we're going to go on for the next month or two. We'll be, uh, mahi and king mackerel fishing. Um, but hopefully by August, October, we'll be back to the stream, wahoo fishing, and hopefully we'll be geared up for that. And then I also like what you got going on. You now offer an inshore option. What's the, uh, inshore offering that Surf City Charters now has? Yeah. So we, um, uh, past week, our guys have been doing a lot of red drum fishing, and actually, they've been doing better than the offshore boat uh, Spanish mackerel fishing at the inlets. They've been producing a lot of very, really good Spanish mackerel, throwing surf, uh, casting spoons and stuff like that at them. Um, black drum been holding real good on the docks. And we've even been seeing some trout still holding around. Well, right on. Captain Daniel Batts, Surf City Charters out of the Topsail Island area. I have thoroughly enjoyed this conversation about baiting for summer mahi, man. I very much appreciate you sharing all that information with us. Absolutely, Gary. I appreciate you having me on, man. It's been a pleasure and look forward to trying to do it again sometime. Right on, Daniel. Enjoy the summer. Thanks, Gary. Have a good one, man. Billy Thorpe. What is going on, Gary? Were you able to keep up? He was dropping it at a pace. I, I think I saw you struggling to keep up, so I'm like, okay, I don't exciting. feel as bad. I, I, mean, I don't feel as bad for not keeping up when Gary is well more versed in the style of fishing and I'm not keeping up. So um, yeah, just the efficiency of delivery, man. If you you don't watch and listen to this podcast and think I want to go fishing with that dude, uh, then yeah, we're on a different we're on a different plane, man. I mean, everything about that made me go, when am I fishing with Daniel? When am I fishing with Daniel Bats? Yeah, man. It, yeah, everything he said was like it was blowing my mind. And it, I write one thing down. I'm like, okay, that's good. Like temperature break. Okay, that's good. That's good around structure. And then I'm like, oh wait, what? Pop the downrigger, float the bait up. Like, <laughs> I, was just, I don't, I don't even have a boat. I can't even go 20 miles or 10 miles. <laughs> but then he did say 20. He said the the, tw- the 10 miles out on a 20 foot skiff. I'm like, I think I got a buddy that has that. I can make that happen. <laughs> so yeah, dude. I mean, literally, look at this paper. I'm just like jotting down all kinds of takeaways. I'm like, okay, this is the whole show. Like, just put, hit the rewind button and go back yeah. again. Yeah, just whatever. That's crazy. That's good, man. I, I mean, that got me fired up. Like, when are we going? Agreed. You know, yeah. I don't think I caught a mahi last year, so it's already on my radar. But now, 
Man, it is high on the radar. Like, yeah. it's got to happen, man. I am juiced. I mean, maybe I'm tooting your horn a little too much or blowing up your ego, Gary, but there's not often times that we have guests on here where you're like, whoa, 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 hold on, back up. Let me figure this out. And I'm like, wait, I'm not that you weren't figuring it out, but he was just dropping so much information. So um, I was like, all right, if you got Gary Hurley scratching his head going, wait, 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 tell me that again, then it must be good. I make sure I didn't miss anything. Yeah. Like, yeah, I mean, it was great. It was Enjoy thorough, it. man. It was very thorough for both of you guys. So appreciate both of you doing such a great job. And really appreciate our Marine Warehouse Center, our sponsors, uh, Bland Landscaping Company, Academy Sports, for making this episode possible. And, yeah, go rewatch this episode or just call Daniel and let him take you out there and show you the ropes because uh, it was – if you can, Gary might book up all his stuff. I don't take know. Take me. Book Daniel. <laughs> And, and invite me. Wait. Is that have I crossed the line, <laughs> even for myself? No, wait a second. Gary has a boat. Take wait, me. Have I even for myself? <laughs> I might have pushed it. You may have crossed the line. <laughs> That's a good line to cross. I wish I would have thought of that. I would have been crossing a while ago. <laughs> All right, Gary, man. I appreciate you, bro. And we'll see you in the next one. All right. Fisherman's boat.